Hello, everybody. This is John Solomon with the Cybersecurity Advisors Network, or CYAN. This is the latest in our series of video conversations with stakeholders, experts, and other interesting people with topics relevant to the industry, um, whether it's cybersecurity, risk management, information security, policy, or anything that will support CYAN's mission to increase the maturity of the global information security uh, ecosystem and uh, society's use of uh, data in a secure and reliable manner. I'm here today with uh, Cormac Callanan. He's the fellow Cyan member. He's also with an initiative called Eziwa. I, th I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. That's the uh, it's a European Union initiative. Uh, uh, stands for Enhancing Security Cooperation in and with Asia. And uh, Cormac is more on the policy side of things. And the reason we're talking today is very, very definitely a policy topic, and that is the American uh, White House uh, cybersecurity strategy that was recently published by the, the the American Biden administration. Now, the the cybersecurity strategy is is very, very interesting. I've I've spent a lot of time reading through this in 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 detail. Specifically, called the uh, National Cybersecurity Strategy, published uh, this March, twenty twenty three. And there's a lot of topics in there that I found very, very uh, interesting and relevant and timely, uh, especially given my background doing a lot of public-private and collective defense work in critical industry, most prominently among them financial services. And what I want to do today is have a discussion with Cormac for regarding the policy implications of this and and you know how this could potentially impact uh, the development of similar policies and and public sector driven. Uh, capabilities in in other jurisdictions around the world, and what maybe some of the major aspects are that we as citizens, as Cyan members, as industry representatives should be aware of. So, Cormac, welcome. Thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, would you like to give a quick introduction of yourself, who you are, where you're coming from? Dan, thank you very much. Very kind of you to invite me to join you today on this activity. Um, I think it's going to be a very timely review. I mean, this is lately published on the 1st of March, the very first day of this month. So it's a very interesting timing uh, for a new policy uh, as we move in towards spring across the world. Um, I'm involved with quite a wide area of policy related activities in an area known as cyber diplomacy, which is the relationship between states in terms of cybersecurity. And this is an issue that has been growing over the last 20 years with a lot of engagement at the United Nations in things like the open ended working group on cyber and separately a group of government experts on cyber. And we're in the middle of a new cyber crime development where there's going to be a new treaty being developed by the United Nations in relation to cyber crime, which would have an impact across the world. The national cyber security policy is a really important area for every country and we'll talk more about that in the coming uh, few minutes. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. So I think I, I, we would benefit from a, a, a quick overview of the, the main points in the, the, the cyber security strategy. Um, it, it's presented as, as having um, five primary pillars as they're called. Mm -hmm. uh, Defending critical infrastructure, disrupting and dismantling threat actors, shaping market forces to drive security and resilience, investing in a resilient future, and forging international partnerships to pursue shared goals. Um, I find this a really just just the, the 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 breaking down of the topics into into these discrete areas. I found it a very insightful way to to recognized i think the main families of challenges and areas for opportunity for for the cybersecurity industry today do you want to talk a little bit about what you think drove these these categorizations well thank you i mean i'd actually even like to take a small step backwards first because overall if you look at the strategy of the ncss it is very much a new style of engagement. It is very much policy-based, for example. If you look at a lot of the discussions in each one of these categories you've just mentioned, they very much deal with uh, investments, the role of government, the role of policy, the role of regulation. Usually, when you see a national cybersecurity policy, you're talking about technical activities, you're talking about technical engagement, the role of search, the engagement at that level of empowering law enforcement to investigate crimes. 
So in a way, this is also showing an evolved state that we're seeing a lot more, in my opinion, across the world, where countries are moving more towards this issue of how you manage the policy at a higher level, at a government level. How much can the government get involved with supervising this? And the tone that you hear in each one of these categories reflects, uh, I mean, for example, the last European uh, cybersecurity policy came out in December of 2020. And at the same stage, we are due another review in a couple in a year's time. It's time to look at how we're going to match what's happening at the U.S. level. So let's talk about what they're trying to do. They're, they're very obvious of the titles. And in fact, one thing I do like about the policy is that it's short. And I don't mean short as in, you know, 10 pages, but I do mean short in terms of 40 pages, because often you have national cybersecurity policies running to several hundred pages, and they make things really difficult to manage and understand the strategy. More importantly, it makes it very difficult to, ma- to measure whether or not they have effectively implemented the strategy after a period of time. Uh, A final point I want to make about the overall thing that I liked very much, and I think this is really important to make, is that uh, very often, as in Europe, we have several policies. We've had one in 2013, one in 2020, and one before 2013 as well. And everyone thinks that when you go to a new cyber policy that it somehow would replace the previous one. But it's not. It's actually a process of the first one is still valid. You have to fulfill all the requirements of that. The second one becomes valid. And then you have to look at them implementing all aspects of the second one. And then the third one becomes along and it brings you new ways and new strategies. I say this because when I'm talking to countries around the world, particularly in Asia, they often look at the European policy, for example, or even the US policy, and they're thinking of, well, let's just jump to the last policy and we'll take all the good ideas from the last policy. But they're missing an awful lot, don't they? Because we have continued to build a process. It doesn't just happen in what's happening today, but it's part of what's gone before, basically. And so it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's really important to see this as building on what was there before. So in the pillar one, very simple, defending critical infrastructure is the focus that we see in Europe, that we bring in a lot of rules about major critical infrastructure requiring protection, energy in the case of the United States, we had several attacks, government in many countries around the world. And in my own country where I'm based in Ireland, we had attacks against our health system, which is a real problem as well. And there's a recognition that it's not enough to tell people they should do it. It's actually now getting to the point of mandating that it has to be done, basically, you know, so there's a real challenge in this whole thing but how do we actually implement uh, that protection how do we mandate that it actually happens and that it's not just a nice wish list on the wall somewhere of course so, go ahead Ted. let's talk about the critical infrastructure part for a second because i come from a a, a very very industry centric view of things and and you're more on the policy side of things and i think this is going to create a really interesting tension in the discussion here the Americans recognized as far back as 1998 the need to not mandate rules for industry, but that something was going to happen, that industry was going to have to at least contribute significantly to figuring these things out proactively. And that was the American uh, uh, PPD, I think it was called 63, which created the idea of the ISAC, the Information Sharing Analysis Center. Mm-hmm. We in Europe here, despite my accent, I'm from Switzerland, so please forgive me. Um, took a long time to figure this out. And it's really only last year, the last two years, that, for example, ANISTA, the European Network Information Security Agency, have have really constructively and actively contributed to this uh, this messy cross-border critical industry collaboration uh, capability rather than really focusing on the member state side of things. Do you see a, a fundamental philosophical difference to difference to the American you know, let's kind of create the playground and support them and the European, let's kind of more mandate how how critical infrastructure and critical industry is defined and how they how they can protect each other. Well, yes, I do think that there's a complementarity about it and there's also a bit of difference in approach. But let me just talk about this issue. You said that we start with industry being encouraged and empowered to go and solve this problem. What's happened in many cases is that it hasn't solved the problem. And there's been major attacks against major systems that the government is saying should have known better in many cases and should have been protected better. And so what they've done is they've divided that approach now into that the critical infrastructure is no longer going to be voluntary. 
from here on out it's going to be mandated it's going to be checked it's going to be verified it's going to be used against you in a future investigation if it sees that some attacks could have been prevented in a very straightforward manner you're going to have to explain in a sense where you lost uh, data in many cases of citizens in the in 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 the Irish health system, for example, that's a huge question in the whole area. So in this area, um, it's not enough anymore to say industry, oh, if you go and do it, it's going to be a case of, okay, industry in general, SMEs, yeah, do the best you can, we're expecting high levels, but for those that are actually working with government, for those that are considered to be a narrow set of industries that are uh, critical infrastructure, they are expected to perform better must do better is the kind of school report on that and in this area they're going to say we're going to check now we're going to mandate that you got to do certain things and if you're not doing this if you're attacked you better have a good reason why you failed or what went wrong in a sense and if that's not explicable then you could be liable for it as well now this is happening in europe and this is now happening in this cyber security policy in the united states as well where they're talking about government well they put it in nicer language they talk about government helping you out but it's also a case of, well, we'll help you out if you don't know what you're doing. But if you're not trying to do it, we will help you out by enforcing it, by mandating it, in a sense. This is vital, I think. And as, as, a, as, an, as a security practitioner, I, I, you know, the business side guys, they hate this. But I think I and many, if not most of my peers, welcome that kind of heavy-handed regulatory approach, holding business leadership accountable for compliance with resilience and good practices, um, Good practice regulation is that is that is that contradictory? You know what I mean, right? Basically, you have to follow the rules. But I think there's two. For me, there are two separate issues here, and the one of them is mandating that you follow certain practices, which, in my view, in the U.S., is a very very fragmented approach. And we we are taking a much more thorough and methodical approach here in Europe, for example, with 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 the NIST two and DORA uh, uh, structures coming out. And the other side is the actual contributory approach. And I think we're well ahead of the game in terms of actually creating the regulations here and the rules of what you must follow. As you said, you know, healthcare across Europe, not just Ireland, has suffered from this. Mm -hmm. What I've seen is, and I think I, I'd love to hear your comments on this because it's probably going to annoy you what I'm about to say, but the EU, I think, suffers from the the very nature of its structure because we've got 20, how many are we now without the balance? 27 now, you know, national stakeholders, there's a big focus on the member state vertical level, whereas the Americans have the advantage that we've got a federal government where CISA and, and DHS and US CERT and, and even, you know, NC, NCFTA and all these entities can very constructively and universally, for example, push out threat intelligence information, you know, capability information, et cetera, as well as monitor. Do you see in Europe a, a, a tendency or at least an objective to create these more operational structures like the Americans have at a European level that can then work with critical industry across borders? There are some of them already existing. You mentioned the NISA already, which does that exact activity. You talk about Europol in the police area. You talk about training for law enforcement and many industries are also happening. Uh, you talk about legal and prosecutorial uh, supporting and activities across Europe. You know, it is a challenge, 27 countries, because you have to remember we have, whatever, 24 languages and 27 cultures in that whole process. And they're coming together with a common aim. I think they've all suffered the same attacks at the Czech Republic had a really bad attack against the health system just like Ireland did and in the same way we can use that experience to actually build on a better approach. You talked about the regulatory approach for example. It's really important to remember the regulatory report is not going to mandate how you do it. It's just mandating that you should do it and really it's in a sense empowering industry and others to say come up with the standards. You get the best practice but you have to follow it. You can't just decide we've got this nice list of things somebody should do somewhere. No, no, no. It's going to be written and it's going to be used against you later if there's a problem particularly if you're in the critical infrastructure what we're doing in Europe is and this is also part of my early argument is that we had a, in 2013 a list of critical infrastructure in 2020 we increased that list quite dramatically to cover a number of other industries based on experience based on COVID based on other things that were happening and what I find for example and I'm talking to some countries in Asia where they're saying right we're going to just adopt the big list you created in 2020 and I'm going no 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 wait, that, that's a really bad idea if you do this list in 13 you 
you need the experience, you need the time, you need the training, you need to hire the right people to do those sort of investigations. You can't just jump into the top end and mandate all these industries. You'll have no experience and you won't have the people to actually do the investigations. So it, it is important to say it will be regulated, it'll be mandated, there's going to be more eyes watching you in this process and it's not enough to sort of shrug your shoulders and go, oh, we've been attacked, we lost data again. It's going to be, hang on a second, how did you lose it? Did you encrypt? Did you have security? What did you do? How did you, you know, protect it? And that's becoming a real key issue in the whole thing is that level of engagement uh, together with government. Uh, one final thing is that, uh, in fairness, I think the European Union, I think the United States in this policy is also recognising, it's recognising their role as a leadership role. And what they're saying is our governments should be protected. Our engagement with citizens should be protected. So we're going to lead this fight by demonstrating that we'll do it first. We'll get involved with the cybersecurity. We'll ensure all our systems have it. We will only buy products from organisations that are trusted in terms of cybersecurity. So... They are quite honestly moving to a world where they, uh, at least with uh, NIS2 and other activities with DORA, as you say, is very much focusing on the EU saying, no, no, we are mandating in some industries in our government that they must be first in, in implementing these activities. So I think that's a good sign. A hundred percent. And I, I do want to, I do want to echo the, 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 the point you make about, you know, it doesn't make sense to push out the house, but the, the do it, you know, because the, the hows already exist, you know, the, the, whether it's NIST or 2700 or whatever at ISO or, or various other frameworks, these are already fairly mature and your risk management frameworks are already out there for industry to, to, to use. These are accepted. These are proven on, on the topic of ANISA and I'll say no more. It, it, I, I do have to say they do a wonderful job when they play to their strengths, which is creating, for example, guidelines and, and good practices. For example, they're the, 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 I keep saying this. The ISAC toolkit they issued is a it's a fantastic piece of work. One universal truth I've seen, whether it's uh, you know initiatives like Cyclone for 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 crisis coordination, or the building up of the CERC network, almost every single critical sector, while they welcome the the creation of forums to coordinate amongst each other, I think could definitely in Europe benefit more from the type of operational cross border information sharing and and threat intelligence. Uh, communication that that the Americans have, that is at a, at a family level. I think John, that's what is happening because that's very much happening with uh, Europol, where they have their own threat analysis that's going on with their uh, I ought to report on a, an annual basis the uh, crime reports. But you're right. I mean, there's more that can be done. But this is the growth of GITs, uh, the joint investigative teams that are happening at Europol, the joint engagement. There's also a commitment in, at the European level, and I see it also in the US document, that they will provide support in the times of crisis, that they will have teams of people capable of engaging. And look, it, it did happen. I mean, we happened, I know, in the Irish health system. We reached out to other countries across Europe, and they gave us some of their best people. You know, the good news, and we see this even with Ukraine, you don't have, have to have boots on the ground. They can all instantly connect in and they can instantly be part of the solution in a sense. And that's what happened with the Irish House. We got help from other countries and it came in immediately from all across Europe. So it does happen, perhaps not in a structured manner or perhaps not with badges and uniforms in many cases. But there is that level of enthusiastic support that kicks in. And it's quite professional now because each one of these countries have got their own insert teams and have their own investigative teams and their own ISAC teams. So they all get involved with that. And I think it's it's very encouraging to see. Forget I mean, Ireland specifically, you know, the Irish NCSC. It's an excellent organization, and I think it's encouraging to see that these are not only coordinating amongst each other, but also with with you know uh, enterprises and 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 organizations uh, across the board in Europe. It's very very good to see. For example, the establishment of the formal European ISACS initiative, which is which is a step in the right direction there. Uh, you mentioned one thing I wanted to touch on, and that is uh, uh, you know security certified. Uh, vendors, and I think that falls under 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 portion three. And I found this really interesting. You know, shape shape market force drive security and resilience. And one of the items in the strategy was that U.S. governments will use its purchasing power to buy from vendors that meet security requirements. Now, I remember back in 2015 when the Cybersecurity Act in Europe was 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 passed. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about security certification. The Americans were howling in protest about things like device security certification. Now we're seeing the administration in the US 
um, explicitly saying that we will support vendors of services and products that meet security certification requirements. This is a hell of a U-turn as far as I'm concerned. How do you think this will affect the, 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 the overall ecosystem in terms of things like product liability, if at all? Will this have a, it's probably a redundant question, will this have a signaling effect elsewhere in the world? Well, I think the signaling effect, let me start with that. I don't know whether it's going to have an effect or whether we're, we are receiving the effect of this happening in other parts of the world. Uh, the whole area of supply chain risks has come into our vocabulary in the last five years. It's not that we didn't know about it before, but it took on a political strategy and political bent. And this has been an issue that's raised by many states, actually even in Asia. It was initially about who's producing your chipsets, who's producing your phones, who's producing your computers, who's producing your routers, who can get access to this material. And then I got into more difficult things about what were default passwords and IoT and the challenges are happening in the IoT space. Then it became the issue of how do you actually get access to, you know, special metals going forward and we're all looking to get them both in the earth and in space at this point in time, looking at other locations for getting these type of activities. The whole supply chain discussion has mushroomed into a very complex multi-strategy engagement. And I think what's happening now is one element of that to solve it is to say that a device regardless of where it comes from, needs to be certified to a certain level or needs to be labelled as having certain levels of security. You need to encourage IoT vendors, for example, to say, don't put in default passwords, we don't like that anymore. And even though it's the easiest solution, a more complex solution, it might be complex in the beginning, but actually it's quite easy in the end. You use the same code that you have in your uh, Ethernet card or you use the same Wi-Fi access code or whatever in, in the device So. Um, what I'm trying to say is that I think that you're getting government involved with saying that, look, again, we're going to buy based on this. And because we're a big vendor, buyer, purchaser in this space, uh, we can actually encourage people to change the way of behavior very easily. Um, and I think that whole supply chain risk is part of that. And the discussion is no longer about, do you buy it from China or do you buy it from North Korea? Or do, it shouldn't really matter where you buy it as long as you can somehow verify the type of technology that's inside it and the type of software that's in use inside that device and therefore access the device and that's really where many other states in the world are going in this area is how do you get that labeling get that certification it becomes something as a kite marking activity to prove that it's trusted source basically and i i gotta say thank 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 god that we're we're that this is becoming a heavily politicized topic because yes absolutely people were aware of the concept of supply chain security years ago, but, you know, especially, you know, business management very often didn't pay attention to it because they could afford not to. So this is a good, this is a very, I, I personally think this is a very interesting change. Now, now one, one, one thing here I also saw, and this resonated very, very strongly given the, the supply chain risk management provisions of, for example, you know, Dora, right? There's a line in there about holding the stewards of our data accountable. Yeah. Yes. Now, given, given okay, there's a statistical, you know, issue with, with, because there's so many data breaches in the U S well, it's because there's so many companies holding customer data in the U S and the federal, federal level data protection rules, except for maybe HIPAA aren't that great. But I find it really interesting to see that, you know, while we in Europe, we've seen a tremendous shift in res responsiveness for, for example, from cloud service providers, right? The Googles, the Microsoft, the IBMs, et cetera. To, to come into line fairly quickly with Dora and his two requirements, whatever comes after. I find it really interesting to see this explicitly mentioned in, 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 in the strategy. Now, this is not a regulation, right? The question is, how do you think they're going to, they're going to go about quote unquote, holding the stewards of our data accountable? That, that it, it hints at some of the experiences that we've learned in Europe with the GDPR. Quite simply, GDPR has uh, caused a lot of panic around the world. It's got to cause a lot of respect around the world. It is provocative in terms of how you deal and how you respond to these challenges. I think the challenge here is that the people at the end of the, day, the citizens whose data has been kept, they really want to know that it's been at least have some basic levels of security. And in this area, we see that in many cases, it's not there. There's a real concern. Actually, I was just reading about a court case that's happening in the United States of a woman who is suing her healthcare provider 
because her data was lost, which included pictures of her naked for, as doing the examination of her cancer activity. And she's basically suing them now for not properly protecting her data. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that as citizens going, hang on a second here, I gave you my data, I trusted you to do it carefully, to encrypt it, to store it location, to make sure it could be act. So again, you get brought into court, you now have to prove that you did something. You can't just say, oh yeah, we put it on a hard disk and you're on and somebody came along and stole the data. Unbelievable, who would do that kind of stuff? It's not going to work anymore. He's going to say, I'm sorry, where did you store this again? Was it securely stored? Was there hardware encryption? What type of stuff was happened to ensure that no one else could actually use it later? And I think that that custodian of the data conversation, it's a valid issue though. If you're giving people your gold, you don't expect them to say, well, we put it in the shelf and the gold was sitting there. Then somebody came along and stole your gold. I can't believe it. It's unbelievable. You know, I would steal gold sitting on the shelf. And you go, yes, it's the same thing with data. Data is the new oil. It's the new gold, if I can put it that way. And in this way, we want people to understand that as a custodian, you are expected to understand, first of all, A, what data are you keeping and why? And for how long are you keeping it and why? And what are you doing to protect it? And what are you doing with it? Who else are you giving it to in this process? All those questions that came out of GDPR, the really important stuff about data minimization and the whole sense that we don't keep data just because. Uh, of course, we came from a history where keeping data just because was really something we all learned to do as in IT. It was something we always learned. Is that, you know, if you get data, keep it because you got to protect it, you got to back it up, you got to have multiple copies of it, you have to have it in several locations, all those activities. Well, you can keep doing that, but now you have to be sure you know where they are at any point in time and how to track your data and how you protect it uh, from disclosure. I, I always find it fascinating. I, I don't think I, I don't think I've ever seen this point explicitly made, but I think we in Europe especially should have always been extra sensitive about this, as you put it, keeping data just because. Because let's let's without going into the details, we've had a few historical, you know, issues that that should have driven that consciousness much more of 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 your data is actually very important. Yeah, and I, I think what what one of the for me one of the very positive aspects of GDPR, one of the many very positive aspects, is that. It will hopefully increasingly sensitize citizens, individuals, data data controllers to the fact that their data is important. You know that no, we're not living in a panopticon. You you your data is is part of who you are individually, and maybe you should think twice about just giving it to social media companies or God knows whom. But at the very least, there is a a sense that there is a legal protective mechanism and a recourse mechanism if you feel this is being abused. So yeah. I'm really going to see it'd be interesting to see if this if this takes kind of more root in 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 the US as a result of this. Well, I mean, what's interesting for me is that we're going into a new era, uh, uh, and that's something we've always said in IT. So how many new eras can one go through? But we're going to an important era of uh, artificial intelligence, and there's some amazing capacity that this is going to bring back in terms of wealth. But one key ingredient of artificial intelligence, particularly in the area of uh, analysis in healthcare or something, or even financial stuff, is going to be the use of big data. You need the data, you need the personalized data of a large group of people to do analysis on cancer histories, to detect uh, crime, including it, activities on the internet and everything. So all these activities require large volumes of data, the so-called big data, the lake of information. What users are going to do is that if you don't treat my data with respect, if you don't protect it in a certain way, I will not give it to you. And if I don't give it to you, then you're going to be handicapped in where you're going to go next with this big opportunity that's coming in IT. And I think what we've got to do is build that trust because the users have lost that trust. I saw, for example, that many uh, governments are currently banning use of TikTok on government devices, for example. And it was very interesting because there was an interview with a lady in the UK yesterday who was going, yeah, why would I care? Because my data is going so many places and so many people, I can't even follow it anymore. And it shows how we're losing the trust of people in many cases, that they don't really understand what they can do and how they can protect themselves. But we're beginning to have at least the regulations in place to enable that protection, to enable that engagement in that sense. And I think that we, if we have this, as you said of yourself in terms of the market forces happening in the, in the US, if we get this engagement, then there's going to be some very interesting investigative uh, research and activities that are going to really show the strengths of AI going forward, for example. 
And I, I think one of the issues for me, at least, as a citizen of a country that is is historically, you know, has 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 historically a strong degree of trust in government institutions. You reg you register with your local government when you move there. Something that's unheard of, for example, in a France or a U.S. Um, I think a lot of that trust from citizens was was lost early on uh, due to cases like you know when Iceland in in two thousand they sold their entire national genetic registry to. Uh, a, a U.S. a U.S. Um, medical uh, company, things like that, where where I think now governments have increasingly realized that that they need to be respectful of of data as a as a vital asset, and I am hoping that we haven't completely lost the trust of individuals in institutions that can help protect that. I think GDPR goes a long way to 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 recovering that. Um, I do tend to cause quite a panic around the world when I say that GDPR is just V1, version 1. Wait for version 2 because there's so much that GDPR does not do that should be covered in some shape or form. And uh, This is an issue for many countries that go, whoa, we haven't even understood GDPR yet. What do you mean? What can possibly come after that? I go, well, GDPR has been around for since 2016 kind of stuff. So isn't it time to start talking about something new, something better? My last my last role involved involved collective defense in, in the financial sector, and that's a lot of information sharing, including including breach and threat intelligence. Ah. And everybody freaked out. Every legal department freaked out about GDPR until you actually read the damn thing and you said, Well, actually, this is explicitly permitted. <laughs> yes. Yeah. They thought about this. You know, this is actually it's not hampering you. And I think this actually this actually goes down to another phrase that I that really jumped out at me. From the American strategy, which is which is regulation can level the playing. I'm quoting a lot here because these are these are phrases that really stuck with me. Regulation can level the play the playing field, enabling healthy competition without sacrificing cybersecurity or operational resilience. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. I mean, the recognition that look, we're not here to to you. You guys need to play with each other nicely. Let the business guys do the business stuff. We're not trying to impact competition, but we're trying to create a common baseline, a safe, a safe sandbox, if you will, where you guys can 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 do your business things. You guys compete in security without having to worry about the bad guys, you know, pulling the rug out from underneath you. I think that that having that explicitly stated in there is is for me a precursor to to some hopefully pretty serious actively cybersecurity regulations deriving from the strategy. What do you what do you think? I I agree. I mean look, these regulations, both GDPR and others around the world, are not designed to prevent reasonable engagement. On the other hand, if you shared information and that shared information then leaks out, that's a problem, basically. You know, the sharing comes with trust. It comes with a commitment that you're going to do the best to protect it. And in, in very sensitive areas, you're going to do more than your pets. You're going to almost guarantee it. And you're going to end up losing your job if you cannot deliver on that activity. And this is where we've seen some really shocking engagements where there's a total disrespect for that data being stored. If you don't mind, I'd like to switch over to Pillar 5, because that's my favorite one of all, which is the area of international partnerships and to pursue shared goals. And this is an area whereby, again, I think it's great to see the United United States and many other uh, regional organizations and national states are beginning to recognize that you cannot work on the internet alone. You have to work with others. And this is happening at the United Nations, for example, where you see a high engagement of people in the area of how do we best improve cybersecurity for states around the world? How do we separate out criminal activity and the internet versus illegal states activity in the and you hear this where they talk about the norms of state behavior uh, as a key element of what would you expect states to do if you're investigating a crime that relates to the incident you would expect other states to support that investigation using their protocols using their legislation within the bounds of law but at least to support the engagement say hey we've just been attacked hospital data was stolen it was someone from your country here we can give you some information we'd like you to do some investigation you would expect them to react and yet in certain cases so far some countries go nothing to do with me it wasn't our problem we didn't lose any data so in that context you have to have this engagement you have to expect states to work together to solve some of these internet related problems and i think this is really important in this international partnerships discussion well this actually ties to something i i i, I also want to bring up and it, it's it's in one of the other pillars in the in the strategy but i think it's relevant to pillar five here and that is the concept of cyber defense as as almost a military topic. Now I've written a paper on this, right? Where, where 
when you're talking to the, the, the military guys, they think military. There, there's a very clear separation of civilian economic sphere. And I got a lot of I got a lot of flack because I used the term attack. When you talk to a military guy, that's a very sensitive piece of semantics because attack means something else. For us in the private sector, you know, we don't really care so much where the attack is coming from, who is doing it, except in the sense that it helps us figure out their tactics, techniques, and procedures, you know, and 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 figure out preventative and countermeasures. Do you think that given this increased focus on international cooperation, that the growth of what we're seeing, for example, among NATO members in increased cyber defense cooperation, not just cyber crime cooperation, but cyber defense cooperation, given the fact that a lot of the major actors these days are either state actors, state sponsored, or state tolerated, even encouraged. Do you think that this is 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 maybe an indication that we're going to see more of an across? I don't want to see mil, say military, but more kind of a collective societal defense mechanism where where states work together more closely to to share information and also with industry across borders. You you raise quite a range of very complex topics in your sentences there. Um, I, when I, I, was, I always get told I need to work on my run on sentences. I'm sorry. No, 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 it's fine, but uh, I'm not sure whether I can answer them all. I'm going to have to tease this apart a little bit. First of all, I think it's important to recognize the strength and the experience that the military organizations have that go back way beyond the beginning of the internet. In many ways, we're coming to this activity very late, the IT group of people, right? In the same way, we uh, the area that I'm working in now called cyber diplomacy, I can tell you, and you know this already from even ordinary everyday diplomacy, that words matter. Words have meaning. And when you say something in a certain way or a certain choice of words, it's recognized between states what they mean. So in the same way you talk about attacks, for example, you know military people go, no, 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 we don't do attacks, we do defense. It's really important to understand that. And that if war breaks out, then we have failed, as most military men will say. Once war is started, that will be there. We're going to turn up for that because that's our job. But in many ways, we have failed and at least... In the worst case, diplomacy has failed in a sense. Words have failed. And that's not ever a good place to be. So, you know, I think we can learn a lot from military in this space because they've been at this engaging. We can learn a lot from diplomacy. And this is what's coming in this space because I can tell you that you and I cannot fix in any way this issue of states against states or states condoning something. This is something that will only ever get fixed at a higher level at the UN or international engagements. And I think this is what happened with law enforcement in many years. I've spent many years in the area of online child protection, and there's a lot we can do with CERT changing information, with hotlines exchanging information, with investigations. But most of that is done with no government oversight. It's quite amazing in many ways that CERT and CERT would almost abhor the idea of having government oversight about what are we sharing with another country. But it's a valid question. In many ways, why are you sharing this with another country? Can you trust the country you're sharing it with? Did you expect them to do something with that data? Could they use it against us or against our allies if you give them that information? Mostly, that's been well negotiated and well established with CERT and all those uh, ISAC activities that we spoke about before. But remember, they've been invented by technical people for a technical problem to solve technical issues. And they really haven't solved, at the higher level issue, bad behavior that goes on at a state level. That will only get solved through diplomacy. And that will only get resolved through sanctions, if necessary, at the highest level. So, for example, the European Union has got the cyber diplomacy toolbox which includes a way of escalating complaints against states all the way up to leading to sanctions against states and say, we are saying that you're doing this. We are saying that you're not supporting us in the investigation. We are saying that you're condoning that activity. We don't accept that. And therefore, we're going to tell you that, A, we're going to name you. Secondly, we're going to actually put in sanctions. We're going to name individuals. We're going to name organizations that will no longer be allowed to work outside that country in cooperation. And you'll see that other countries are doing the same thing, basically, this whole area of building that to respond at a state level. So I think my problem is that if we thought CERT or ISAC would solve those state level activities, we were wrong, right? I and I think, but no, no, yeah, I think there's any 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 misunderstanding there at all. I think um, the key is here what we saw with Europol. It took a long time, for example, for the financial sector to get EC3 to talk to them 
uh, as as an entity, but they've come around and built this wonderful the um, what's it called the the Europol I think it's the expert group industry uh, advisor group. There's different groups. Advisor. I'm on the I'm on the industry advisor group myself, but there's also a financial advisor group and there's a cybersecurity advisor group. Yes, where they go for that multi stakeholder engagement. They bring in other organizations and other skills, the private sector, to get their experiences and to share knowledge with them and tell them what they're seeing at Europol level across all the states. I mean, finally, I'd say that if you look at law enforcement, this also came out of law enforcement. They can investigate crime and you would expect them to do that. But if that crime is coming from another state, they're not going to turn up in the other state and arrest the head of that state. It's never going to happen in this context. It's not something that's allowed under UN laws and everything else. So that activity then becomes an issue for law enforcement to say, okay, we can do a certain level of crime investigation, but when it goes to a state level engagement, then we need to hand that over to countries and a higher level, the United Nations, to resolve those issues. And the United Nations has been working now for 20 years and coming up with those procedures and processes. And in this document, the United States, they very much pay tribute to all the work that's going on on this norm to state behavior and confidence building measures and capacity building that's happening in this space. I think, I mean, especially the Americans in this case, I mean, maybe, maybe a nice shout out because people are always ripping on them. We've already seen in terms of operational international collaboration, I mean, the FBI and, 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 and various other entities had been quite supportive. You know, there was a, a number of takedowns done jointly. There was a couple of years ago, there was one with the Romanian national law enforcement and these are mechanisms, I think, that they're they're already either well established and working, or at least recognized to be in development. And I found that at, a, at an operational level, these this type of cooperation seems to already be pretty good. Yeah, and I don't think anybody in industry is under any illusion that we should be playing at a diplomacy level, at a at a at a in, interest interstate level. I think it's it's clearly understood that this is tactical, that the industry needs to defend itself, needs to work together, but also needs to work with government partners when brought in and trusted, as for example in this 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 Europol case. And I think this is something that that having that that seeing this also explicitly called out in the strategy document, for example, they call out the ISACs, they call it industry collaboration. I think that's going to be a very, very encouraging sign for 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 even more such interactions, you know, while the governments are doing the government things, industry is doing the industry thing, that at least everybody is going to internationally be talking more amongst each other and creating this this stronger capability overall. You know, we have this terrible thing happening at the moment in Europe, which is called the war with Ukraine, for example, or the, that's happening between Russia and Ukraine. And I can only imagine a day where the same level of global panic or anger is going to happen when you hear about cyber attacks across borders, in a sense. Now we take them every day and just assume they're a part of the IT life. But honestly, we're trying to get to a point where the idea of another state attacking in cyber, another a third state, will be totally unacceptable. It'll be called out as being, hey, you know, country X is now currently doing a cyber attack against country Y. This has got to stop or we're all going to stop selling product to them or buying product from them. I mean, this level level of panic we're in at the moment relates to a real world kinetic war. Of course, I know they're doing cyber as well. I fully understand that. And that's also got its problems. But what would happen to the day when it's only a cyber war, when it's below that threshold, they say, of an actual kinetic war? It's going to receive the same level of global attention where they're going to say, this is not good enough. This has got to stop. And that's where we're heading towards in this world is to recognize the number of cyber attacks that are going on and to seek to stop them and, and to differentiate between criminal behavior, which will always go on and states that should not be allowing this and should not be engaging in that way, basically. Well, this is why I find it so interesting that, that the, the Biden administration's document here, they explicitly call out Russia and SolarWinds, uh, China and, and Microsoft Exchange and leaving out you know North Korea and Lazarus and all that kind of thing. And I think it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about if you're the industry, you care less what the motivation, what the actor is behind something, you know, that's obviously a question for the diplomats and the law enforcement and the military guys to figure out if they need to get involved in that. But I find it very, very interesting that especially for an official document, which are usually very, very cautiously phrased, uh, granted nowadays, I don't think anyone needs to be really very cautious about mentioning the Russians, calling them out, uh, that they would so explicitly put that in there. One encouraging thing for me is an anecdote I want to share, and that is a couple of years ago, I organized a law enforcement and financial services joint closed door confidential meeting for information exchange. Somehow, don't ask me how, I, I too much stuff to do, no assistant. 
we ended up with a guy from the Chinese National Cert in attendance. He wasn't supposed to be there, all right? Once he started talking, though, it turns out that this guy was a cybersecurity professional, not a government, well, you know, your classic, you know, your Ministry of State Security person, because he started sharing stuff about attacks on the Chinese financial system and, and, and you know, types of malware actors and types of threat and fraud actors that just left us, you know, jaws agape because this is stuff that we hadn't seen. So regardless of what at the geopolitical level we may or may not be seeing in terms of state-sponsored attacks or state-sponsored cyber or cyber sabotage or espionage or whatever, you know, even with the Russians, you know, there there is a significant part of industry and population that are subject to exactly the same kind of garbage that we are, and I think that's that for me is a is a is a glimmer of hope. You know, because you know, the, the, these are these are the people who are not setting out to destroy and undermine Western democracy and 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 attack entire infrastructures, but actually are suffering from exactly the same kind of stuff that keeps me and you know our peers awake at on, at, at, uh, at night and on weekends. You know, and and I think hopefully at some point, you know, maybe the optimist to me says that we'll be able to tie these kind of uh, these actors into the same the same structures that we all use to defend ourselves against the pure quote unquote cyber criminals. Uh, I agree. Look, we are moving towards a world of attribution and attribution requires names in many cases. And sometimes it's the name of a state, sometimes the name of an organization, sometimes it's the name of an elusive hacking group or something. But at the end of the day, they end up with real people in front of keyboards with the fingers on those keyboards. And as long as we can get to a world where the attribution process is transparent and open and is one that we can be checked by our independent third parties, then that's a good thing to do is to get to the attribution and then we can lead into this area of sanctions. I mean, what are the penalties when states misbehave? At the moment, the problem we have is uh, we've designed a system which is too easy to hide. It's too easy for people to actually do the attacks, the malicious uh, activities, and then pretend that it had nothing to do with them or they don't know who did it. Um, and I think we all realize, uh, like you just said, that every state in the world is suffering cyber activities, malicious cyber activities. And uh, where it's criminal, we should all work together to prosecute that. And where it's a state activity, then we have to find a way to actually get states to realize that they don't want to do that, that it's not a good thing. And I think usually... We're very successful with that. We have a couple of glitches in the world in terms of war zones and breakouts of revolutions and everything. But overall, the world appreciates a stable, peaceful environment, basically. I think that's a good thing. That's a good point to wrap up on. Uh, I think, you know, as most professionals or all professionals, hopefully, <laughs> whether in the public or the private space, are, are, are just looking to get home on time on weekends. So... With that, uh, Cormac, I really want to thank you for your insights, for your points, and for a very, I, I found a very constructive discussion on this topic. It's a, As you said, it's a very complex one. We could go on for hours, I think, about various aspects of this. I will link to the uh, uh, cybersecurity strategy below, as well as the various EMU and, and other documents that we mentioned. I'll also link to Cormac and, uh, as, again, Ezewa, right? So Ezewa, correct. Yeah, Ezewa. In the, in the comments. Um, for anybody interested in, in in this video or other topics, I encourage you to get in touch with us. Have a have a check, have a look at our website at uh, cybersecurityadvisors.network. Again, we're an international not-for-profit trust community of the cybersecurity industry. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, uh, whether it's on LinkedIn or by mail or on our website. And I wish you a very successful and, and hopefully cyber attack free uh, rest of the week and look forward to catching up with you. And happy St. Patrick's Day. Don't forget that coming tomorrow. Patrick's Day. Thank you very much. And that the same to everybody who is watching. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Sure.